have this like fancy like Britney Spears style lav on. I feel I don't even know.、Uh, not quite like Britney, unfortunately.、Um, so、uh, just quickly, the the book is、uh, Unladylike: How to Smash the Patriarchy. Maybe a patriarch,、uh, but how to smash the patriarchy and claim your space. Men in the room, get ready. <laughs> and women.、Um, so first of all, thank you so much to Blake and the Creative Mornings team for inviting me here.、Um, this is an intimidating crowd because y'all are just such an incredible dynamic community here in Atlanta, and it truly is an honor for me to get up and talk to y'all about. This month's theme of equality,、um, which was a doozy.、Um, I wrestled with it for a while, trying to figure out how to talk about equality in a relatively short amount of time,、uh, in a way that is fitting for Creative Mornings,、um, and. Also, because we probably can't talk enough about equality these days,、um, I think that we need to be having these conversations more and more.、Um, and、uh, over the time that Caroline and I have been working together, starting with stuff Mom never told you and how stuff works,、um, we have spent thousands of hours, I think, probably too many hours, researching and. Talking about and contenting, where are my fellow content creators at?、Um, all around women and gender and different facets of equality, and more often than not, inequality.、Um, so it's such it's such a massive concept. How do we even kind of grasp it? Because I think a lot of times. Our tendency with equality is to talk about and define it in、uh, what it is not. It is not、uh, discrimination. It is not a gender wage gap. It's the absence of all of those things. But when it comes to what equality is, a positive vision of it,、um, that can be a little a little tougher. And it can also feel like we're just talking in like inspirational Pinterest quotes. Um, so hopefully, what I'm going to offer today、um, is something a little more accessible,、um, maybe something a little bit more creative,、um, and something that we can take as creators and makers and communicate and translate out to the world to people. Who might not be so like jazzed and psyched to talk about like intersectional feminism? Who wants to get into some data points? I do always, but、um, I won't do that today.、Um, and、uh, just to give you a little sense of where I'm coming from with all of this. Also, I'm sorry if my back is to you at some point. I'll try to do an over-the-shoulder.、Um, this is, yeah.、Uh, so <laughs> to give you a sense of. Um, my experience with researching equality and the work、uh, that I've done with my work wife Caroline、um, in making stuff Mom never told you, a podcast and a YouTube show initially, and now with our independent venture, Unladylike Media, I figure、um, kind of the best way is to start off with some one-star iTunes reviews of our podcast、um, or former podcast. <laughs> Just to kind of like give you, also to give you like an IRL idea of like if we're gonna be serious about this equality thing, not everybody is gonna like it, <laughs> especially if you're a woman <laughs> talking about it. I mean, just you know, hashtag real talk.、Um, so、uh, some of these are some of my favorite one-star iTunes reviews、um, of Caroline and me on stuff I've never told you, talking about like feminism and all this stuff. If you want to hear two lesbian feminists flirt with each other, then this one's for you. There's a typo in that,、um, and that's my fault. I claim that. That was not the commenter.、Uh, 
But this next one, um, the menstrual cycle has come up in each of the first two podcasts. Shoo have been called Stuff Mom Never Told You for Women. That's, do you know how long that URL would be, man? Like, Stuff I've Never Told You is already too long. Um, oh, and finally, this, this uh, last one, too, is from uh, a commenter, Cecilia52, which is just funny because she says, I like my podcast to provide interesting information with good delivery. They can skip the unique female perspective. Um, so this is, it's not always an easy topic to, to talk about and to communicate. I think that it's often alienating for some people Because, of course, we want to think the best of ourselves. Like, we're all, like, good humans in here. Like, how on earth could we possibly be contributing to anything but a bright and shiny uh, United Colors of Benetton uh, future for everyone? Um, but the fact of the matter is, I'm actually going to skip forward two slides. Um, I feel like I need to start off, too by saying, like, yeah, we, we have good intentions, um, but also uh, that is my result of the BuzzFeed quiz, How Privileged Are You? <laughs> that is the best photo of me ever taken. Um, and <laughs> oh, man, I got to bring that hair back. Um, so I scored a 58 out of 100, uh, and I am quite privileged, because that, that girl, In the photo, um, you know, what, what, a, what a look. Uh, I, I would not have thought of myself as super privileged. I grew up in Athens um, in a pretty low-income home. Um, I, like, my world felt very small. Um, and a lot of times this word privilege is another one that people immediately kind of like, ugh, that can't be me. You don't know my experience. How dare you call me privileged? Um, but to me, this is part of a first step of this DIY equality ethos, which is being willing to be honest with ourselves and take some BuzzFeed quizzes, if necessary, <laughs> to learn more about ourselves <laughs> instead of going to therapy. <laughs> um, And to give you a little snapshot, too, of, uh, of work past one-star iTunes reviews, instead of giving you my whole resume, I feel like these two logos kind of sum everything up. Um, and they started from a place of uh, unintentional DIY equality. So Stuff Mom Never Told You uh, launched in 2009. And it came about from How Stuff Works where I was writing articles every week, um, fresh out of college, um, go dogs. Uh, and I noticed that I didn't see myself reflected in, in much of the, the content that I was writing. I mean, it's very, for people who aren't familiar with this site, it's very Wikipedia-esque. Um, so deeply researched um, and, yes, credible. Uh, But even though we were writing these kind of general interest types of articles, I never saw anything about women or gender or anything that might suggest that um, anyone but, you know, that other than white men exist. And so I asked if I could make a podcast with um, another writer at the time that would focus specifically on that saying, hey, this is an opportunity. This isn't, I'm not coming to you with like a criticism, but rather saying, this is something I'm really interested in. And could we take all of this kind of research that we're doing and just kind of dig into the woman's side of things? And so that's how Stuff Mom Never Told You came about. And honestly, when I was 23, asking my boss, at that, question, asking my boss that question, I didn't realize what I was asking to do. I didn't realize that what I would learn, along with Caroline, over the next 742 episodes of that podcast that I would record, how much I would learn about 
not just my identity as a woman and what that means, and femininity and what that means, but also my identity as a straight person, as a white person, as a person who grew up in the home that I did, in the place that I did, in the city where I am. The place where we are in Atlanta has so much significance as well. And both Caroline and I became so consumed with the fact of all of these things around us that we're all walking around with, all of these different identities, that we kind of just take for granted and don't pause to think about, um, that we decided that it was time for us to uh, pack up our bags, our little feminist bags. Um, I guess you call them purses. <laughs> <laughs> and start our own company, Unladylike. Um, I, I am going to quickly shout out, I don't want to embarrass her, but um, the brilliant woman, uh, Sarah Lawrence, who made that living infographic, also made that amazing logo for us. <laughs> she the best. Um, and uh, I, I also emailed Blake <laughs> before this, asking if it was okay to use the full logo, because I didn't want to be like, eh. You know, don't know if they'll like make the wrong impression. Um, but this has really been the trajectory. Like starting off, like I feel like that like white kind of empty bathroom woman was me at 23. Like I don't have I mean, who put what you will in my head. I don't know. Uh, to like yes, I have a statement now. Um, it's not directed at y'all, but with y'all, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> So this has been sort of a process of DIY equality, trying to make this change that we wanted to see in the type of content, whether that's audio, video, editorial, um, making the, the stuff that we wanted to see in the world, and also making the things that we wish we had had, the information that we could have had when we were younger, trying to figure all these things out, not even really knowing that that was what we were trying to figure out all the time. Um, going back to this one, hey, there she is again. Um, and this is so significant to this group in particular, Creative Mornings, because like Abby and Alana, we're my Broad City fans, <laughs> equality and creativity go together so perfectly. They have such a symbiotic relationship. Now, Alana can exist without Abby, and Abby can exist without Alana, but they are not as strong as they are together. Um, and the same goes for equality and creativity. Being super creative doesn't necessarily mean, as anyone who's been probably in um, a, a creative roundtable discussion, Super creative people don't necessarily always want to be really inclusive because we like our ideas, right? Um, and we have the best and brightest vision. Um, and likewise, well, Alana, I mean, like, that's the thing. Alana's equality because, like, you can't bring Alana into a room and it not get better. Um, and when you put those two things together, both your creativity improves, and also, when creativity meets equality, our approaches to equality improves. And the good thing for all of y'all is that through this concept of DIY equality and really taking more of a creative and accessible approach, all of us have the creative power within us, regardless of how creative you think you might be or not, all of us have the creative power to start making and cultivating the equality and change that we want to see in our worlds. And when I say our worlds, I'm talking about this world. I'm talking about our communities, the people that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. And the challenge, though, if we're thinking about equality and what we as individuals can do, not talking about like, oh, let's just like go out and end racism, that'd be amazing, but like, I mean, one of us, we, we alone cannot do that. Um, but if we think about uh, just our personal responsibility, knowing that we want equality, 
knowing that we want to be good humans, knowing that we want to make other people's lives better, we still have this little pesky thing. Um, well, sorry, but equality starts with you. Also, guys, you. That was a message I forgot to emphasize. Um, but we have this pesky thing in our brains right there. It's called the amygdala. And it's sort of our seat of bias. And if there are any neuroscientists in the room, I am sorry for just like really collapsing down a lot of science into a really bad Photoshop job. Um, but this idea of implicit bias is something that I was thinking about a lot with how it interacts with creativity and something that we as creative people need to be aware of because implicit bias is sort of the, th the thing that perpetuates a lot of discrimination that we might not even realize is happening, that we are perpetuating. Things called, that we call microaggressions, um, ways that we like snap judge people based on the way they look. Um, and the research that has been done on this finds that when we're making those kinds of stereotypical judgments and just sort of operating automatically, uh, it's our amygdala, our emotional seat in the brain. Some people call it like our lizard brain. It's a very old part of our brain that's essentially like our threat response. We see, some, we see difference and automatically our brain says, Ugh, is that okay? Like, are we, are we still safe? Um, and while that can, as like a human species, be like a very uh, helpful trait, not so helpful if we want to cultivate equality because we need to be inclusive, but our brains are wired sometimes to be exclusive. But the good news is creativity is a pretty powerful antidote to that because what does creativity make you do? It makes you be more mindful, it slows you down, you have to brainstorm, for better or worse. Um, and all of those kinds of very basic processes that we are probably putting into practice on a daily or weekly basis, these are actually really powerful tools. These can be superpowers even. And we, I think, take them for granted. Um, but again, like this is, this is something to keep in mind in terms of our personal responsibility and what we can do to cultivate equality. And there's sort of a three-step process that I wanted to lay out of how to actually put that in place. Because it's all about execution, right? We can have all sorts of wonderful brainstorms and like great ideas. Um, personally, I'm learning the truth of that with writing a book with Caroline. So many great ideas. Making that into a book is a lot different. So this, hopefully, is something that we can all integrate into our lives. This is, there's no fancy language. There are no statistics to remember. This is really, to me, just basic good humaning, AKA DIY equality. And step one is something that Caroline and I have really come to appreciate so much with our work, which is just the basic value of curiosity of being open not only to learning more about the world around you, but also, again, like learning about yourself, whether that's taking a BuzzFeed quiz or whatever that might be, because it provides context. And once we start getting more context, that helps us become more emotionally intelligent to understand people better who might not look like us, that we might not think that we have anything in common with them. This is where curiosity comes in. And curiosity also steers us away from our very American individualistic idea of uh, success and perseverance and moves us toward a more collectivistic mindset, a more community-based mindset. And if we, again, are serious about this equality thing, we have to think collectively. This can't just be about making the world as good as possible for us. Um, 
especially if it's just a white person, because I'm like, well, it's already that way. Uh, and when it comes to thinking about equality in a more curious and open kind of way, we move away from this sort of idea of equality on paper, which I think a lot of times we think of equality as synonymous with just being equal or uniform. Um, this idea, this, this <laughs> wrong idea that feminism is just about the idea that men and women are exactly the same. No, it's not static or selective. Equality in action is dynamic, it's diverse, and it emphasizes inclusion. And we've all seen this go down with the bathroom bill, of course. Um, and I realized through all of this, it's very ironic that for so long our logo was that bathroom lady. So I think that, I think that that's progress for us. Um, and the next step is building empathy. Because once you have that curious mindset and you are really building up your emotional intelligence, that allows you to start building empathy. And in order to do that, especially depending on where you're coming from, myself right now as a, as a straight white lady with a college degree, I need to be better at active listening because I'm walking around with a very particular and relatively privileged perspective on things. And it is crucial when we are wanting to make space, make safe spaces, make inclusive spaces and healthy spaces like this, that we are open to actively listening. And the byproduct of this is getting used to getting uncomfortable, of admitting that maybe there are things that we aren't doing that we could be. Maybe there are things that we are doing that we shouldn't be doing. I mean, just being, just being open to having uncomfortable conversations, um, all of these kinds of things are part of this process because <laughs> we, we have no time to waste in terms of getting rid of our comfort zones if we want to really change things for the better. And when it comes to being creators, one thing that we have really gleaned from, <laughs> I was really proud of that Photoshop. Um, one thing that Caroline, have, Caroline and I have witnessed firsthand in really trying to practice that active listening piece and the empathy piece, sometimes that means like keeping up with our email inboxes <laughs> piece. Uh, so you are hearing your audience. But allowing yourself to reflect the change that your audience wants to see in the world, rather than just trying to make something that you think that they need. Um, and again, this is going to shift and change depending on where you're coming from and what you're doing. Um, but there's something really powerful with meeting that need of an audience, and an audience realizing that they are being heard for the first time and validated for the first time. Whether that is in simply seeing themselves reflected in a way that they've never seen through imagery, or having conversations that have never addressed aspects of their lives, um, and, and finding meaning and community. Again, all of this diverts back to community and inclusion. And finally, you got to raise some hell. Um, because, again, it's nice to like, have these wonderful conversations and like, get a group together, and we're all feeling validated. But then what do we do with it? We got to shake some, some stuff up. Um, and in order to do that, You've got to be ready to speak truth to power. Uh, <laughs> you have to be ready to do something uh, I call making conscientious friction, which is not just like automatically clapping back on Twitter, but actually raising a ruckus with a purpose, um, which can be hard to do, I think, in our, uh, our type of work and social media environment that we're in. And it also takes persistence. I mean, there's so much of this that I see 
that we can learn from the way that we talk about product, for instance, today and beta testing and the importance of failure and try and try again and iterate and all of that stuff, why don't we apply that also to how we approach equality, whatever that might mean for you? Like, why don't we accept the fact that we need to beta test, that we need to iterate, that we need to listen to our users and fix that user experience and take our ego out of it as the creators and also accept that failure will happen. And that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be shunned from the community, but rather, as they say in Silicon Valley, fail up. Can we start failing up? Because I think um, we've seen time and time again that even with the best of intentions, um, we are not always perfect in our uh, embodiment of equality, our attempts at equality. Um, and I think that that's okay okay, because humans will never be perfect. Instead, we need to be persistent. And one thing that I was thinking about with all of this is the context of us doing this in Atlanta. Because I don't know about y'all, but I went through a phase for a long time when I first moved to Atlanta saying, this is just my stopover to New York, because that's where all the action is. You know, if we're going to be creators, we need to be in the center of all the action. But Atlanta, if we're talking about the home of creative equality, there is no better place to do it than Atlanta, because it is truly this city's legacy. Um, I just want to leave John Lewis up there for a second. Where's my, where are my six district neighbors at? <laughs> um, when I was uh, trying to kind of figure out what the final message would be, what kind of ties all of this together, this idea of DIY equality, what that looks like in action, and thinking about it in the context of John Lewis, um, I don't know how many of y'all have heard about his saying, uh, making good trouble. Um, that's what he, how he describes his experience of getting arrested 40 times, because he was making good trouble. He was doing the work and getting in trouble in the way that he needed to in order to make that change. And my hope for all of y'all in thinking about this, of striving for equality in Atlanta, is that we can get energized and get creative and go and make some good trouble. Because y'all, equality cannot wait. So let's do it.